myself. Put someone who speaks English. Get the short order chef. Hello. 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 Are, are, you are the short order chef, are you? I'm Gleb Losev. Oh, hello, Gleb. Hello. I, 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 I make... Yes, say it. Hamburgers. I make hamburgers. Yes. Um, are you all right for Levi's and Beatles records? Beatles records? Yes, I understand you, you were a bit desperate for those in the 60s. I wonder if that's still the case. Oh, pl please, uh, send, uh, send me... Uh, send you some Beatles records, all right. Uh, where, where do you calling? Oh, I'm phoning from a, a pinprick somewhere in Western Europe called Britain. Do you know, remember a friend of mine, Mr. McLean and Mr. Burgess? No, I don't know. They used to sit at the back of your restaurant. Do you remember seeing them as you maybe trolled out there in your pinafore and gave them a meaty bender? No, I don't remember. You don't remember them. They were buggers. What? They bugged people. And I wondered if you'd be interested in an advertising slogan I've come up with. It goes like this. What is the difference between a Moscow hamburger and Sputnik 2? No, I don't know. I'll tell you. You can be certain there was a dog in Sputnik 2. <laughs> Hello? so far. <laughs> oh, he's looking a bit perky, don't you think? Handsome devil. We're trying to stimulate his subconscious by playing TV programs to him. His brain isn't just receiving the programs anymore. He started pumping them out. So that's the story so far. Sure, tell you what, Gov. Mm. Driving around your body every week, yeah. I get you to have those philosophical... Philosophical, oh, yes. Yeah, Philo that's right, philosophical big old forms. Yes, really, I couldn't give a tinker's yeah. cuss. I was but... thinking the other day while negotiating your asparagus... Uh, esophagus, yes. Your asparagus, yes. yeah, I thought, if there is a caring God, mm. how is it he gave ugly people a sex drive? <laughs> mm, we've not tackled that conundrum in Reader's yeah. Digest. Just drive on by my lower intestine, will you? Uh, I think it would be better if we took a shortcut through your bowels. Uh? Intestines get very busy at dinner time. Oh dear, how very odd, Governor. What? My accent's changed. Oh. My voice has dropped completely out of character. You're right, it's gone. Vandalism. Those teenagers oh. completing vandals, they are. Oh. They've, they've nicked my characterization. It really is outrageous. Oh dear. The I Spy Book of Teenage Problems. Terrible. Well, I miss Don't seven. call it dancing. Number one, grannies. Have you got a girlfriend yet? Have these you, sadistic grannies have got into the phrase, have you got a girlfriend yet? To teenagers who have no girlfriend, due to problem number two. Shut up! Teenage problem number two, acne. Acne. Oh, I think I'll split something. The Lord God Almighty has an advanced but somewhat warped sense of humour and equipped teenage boys with vast amounts of testosterone, thereby ensuring that they reached their sexual peak at exactly the moment that their faces turned into plates of baked beans. So no chance of a girlfriend there. Is he shy? Shy, shy, oh, he's shy, shy, shy. Oh, he doesn't like people talking about nah. him, does he? No, 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 which is why a vacuum cleaner comes in handy, because simply by switching the machine onto full suck and applying the nozzle to the neck, spotty celibate teenagers can show hickeys to their friends and talk convincingly of nights of unbridled passion. Problem number three, bored teenagers. Back in the 1960s, bored teenagers didn't know how to make their own entertainment and simply hung around on the streets all day. Things were so bad that vicars used to lead gangs of young ruffians on motorbikes to the coast to beat up seaside towns. Disgusting. Fortunately, nowadays, kids know better and keep themselves off the street. Literally. Now they don't just make their own entertainment, they take their own entertainment too. 
Oh, this could have been avoided if Fisher Price had never marketed the Junior Ram Raider kit 15 years ago. Problem number four ugly teenagers in the 1960s. The biggest problem for television prior to 1964 was that only hideously ugly teenagers volunteered to appear on it. Look at that. Oh dear, look at the state of that. Look. Thank God things are entirely different in today's world of sophisticated teenagerdom. We're a singing telegram and we've just learned that your dear grandmother has been badly burned. We're singing this message in memoriam. Cause they don't mess about down at the crematorium. Mm. Thanks very much for coming in at such short notice. How are you bearing up? I've been left with a gaping cousin since his accident. I bet you have. I could give you something for that. Mm. Ah, Goblin Gulp, the food presenters. We've got the presenters in for an end of series checkup. There's been a bit of trouble. Come and have a look. Mmm. Tastes great. Mmm. Tastes great. He's forgotten he's supposed to taste the studio recipe first and then do the hmm, tastes great routine. Hmm. Tastes great. Come away. It's not a pretty sight. There's more of it in there. I'm getting sawdust. There's a tang of horse rubbing. No, there's hot buttered toast and brew cream. And a hint of Mr. Sheen. Man, there's some tar in there. There's bullshit in there. Severe case of the metaphors. The middle classes simply can't admit that they like getting legless for its own sake. Oh. yet another catastrophe. Acts of God? No, they're the work of one person, an evil mastermind, who, whenever there's a global disaster, is always lurking at the scene of the crime. It is Mother Teresa. Don't be fooled by the look of compassion. She's the one causing all the disasters. Don't you see? She's always there. Famine in Ethiopia. She ruined the crops while no one was looking by releasing lots of brandy locusts from a jam jar. Meltdown at Chernobyl? It's her again. The night before, she pressed the button that said, don't press this button. Tidal floods. It's her. The shriveled nun was up to her tricks again. She pulled her finger out of the dike. But just like all criminals, she, she has to return to the scene of the crime. But she is not alone. Other fanatical cells operate under her control, working ceaselessly to spread global misery while pretending to do good deeds for humanity. Esther Ranson, codename Shogar, demoralizing the nation by showing them root vegetables that look like penises. But the most dangerous couple of all are the brother and sister team of Thora and Douglas Hurd. Two family trees collide in kith and kin. <laughs> London, 1960-something. A long shot, a hundred extras. Thora Heard was a BBC producer working on a pilot programme never to be transmitted, the Eurovision Atrocity Contest. Welcome to the 8th Annual Eurovision Hosted by Katie Boyle, the show ended in uproar after the mass extermination of the Kulaks was given only three points by the Luxembourg panel. Meanwhile, Douglas was touring the Middle East playing lead mandolin in the Cat Stevens Band. While visiting Mecca, Mecca. While visiting Mecca, thank you, Cat, Dougie and Thora fell under the influence of the Prophet Muhammad and decided to embrace the Muslim faith, vowing henceforth to serve the cause of Islamic fundamentalism. Between them, 
they would bring Western civilization to its knees. Operating from a beach hut in Frinton, they secretly went into publishing, launching the fundamentalist Muslim fashion magazine, The Shiite Face. The magazine caused outrage across Britain. It didn't feature full TV listings like what TV Quick does, and it was soon forced to close. Thora, meanwhile, had founded the provisional paramilitary wing of the WRVS and started to implement Islamic-style justice, taking out wrongdoers by force-feeding them with macaroons and submerging them in swimming pools of hot, sweet tea. Smashing. Even her own family was not exempt, as Douglas found out to his cost when she amputated his foot after a parking violation. That will have made your day, Harold and Peggy Bland in Chingford. She gained entry into pensioners' homes by offering to entertain them with Tupperware displays. Displays. But once inside, Lovely she China. secretly placed strawberry pips in their steridon, causing painful itching under their upper sets. Meanwhile, after a brief stint as presenter of This Is Your Life, Douglas realized he could do more lasting damage by entering politics. He toured the country, fomenting unrest. Then he went home and laughed when no one was watching. Well, it's now quarter to two, and Mr. Hurd has been safely shepherded away. But this is what's been left behind him, utter chaos and devastation. Many people in this area simply don't know which way to turn for safety. Fora replaced Praiseby with a new game show, Cast the First Stone, combining ruthless Islamic-style justice with top-quality light entertainment. The BBC would like to make it clear that the last item, featuring numerous blasphemous allusions to the Islamic faith, was written by uh, Salman Rushdie, to whom all death threats and other fatwas should be addressed. OK, he didn't really write it, but he's got one fatwa already. Another one won't make much difference, will it? Uh, those who wish to contact Mr Rushdie should be aware that he is in hiding. There it is. Hiding. A quaint little village in the Cotswolds, twinned with the Italian town of Incommunicado. Why nobody's spotted him there yet is beyond me. After all, the BBC and all those media chappies, they're always announcing that Salman Rushdie is in hiding. Oh, look, another fat was arrived. Strange how you never get thin was. They're all there as well. There's Carlos the Jackal, he's in hiding. He lives at number 23 High Street, hiding. And only last week, Michael Jackson booked into Glenn Miller's bed and breakfast. Lord Lucan's there too, he runs the pub. Hello, Lord Lucan. Pint for me and a packet of pork scratchings. Perhaps not, I've seen where the pig scratches. And there's Adolf Hitler. He's had the corner shop since 1945. Corner shop, corner shop, what could that be about? Corner shop, corner, oh, it must be leading to a punchline. That's what it'll be. Ha <laughs> corner shop. So, bye-bye, Carlos. Bye-bye, Adolf. And bye-bye, a lot of extras who didn't look at all like the people they were supposed to be. Something to cheer you up. Sushi. That's right. Sushi. We never have it at home, do we? Because you wouldn't eat raw fish. It's funny, isn't it? You marry someone because you fancy them, let's face it. And then after a couple of years, day in, day out, they just blend into the furniture. You know, this is the first time I've actually looked at you closely in ten years. And now that I am, you're bandaged from head to toe. That should be one of God's lucky jokes, I expect. There you go. Open wide. Oh, look. Some squid to go with it. magical voice of Frank Sinatra brought you on a brand new collection called Songs for the Gaseously Challenge. Yes, Bargain Basement Records are proud to present a full hour of dyspepsia as Old Blue Eyes belches his way through 20 classic ballads. Delight as Frank combines romance with unbridled digestive disorders in his magical rendition of You Go to My Head.
who go to my head. And you linger like a hot refrain. And who could forget Frank blowing his groceries in his tender rendition of I've Got You Under My Skin. I've got you under my skin. Delight, songs that'll bring a lump to your throat and Frank's. Now, Gov. Spleen, femur. I could do you a nice guided tour of your week, Governor, if you want. Uh, all things considered, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's yeah. What? Yeah. What? 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 Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. say all things considered again, Gov. Uh, why is that? Chris High start considering everything in the universe. Uh, and my steering goes funny and my brains blow up. Oh, listen, you third rate narrative linking device. Yeah. Take me to my ellipse immediately. I wrote a book about my ellipse, yeah. you know. Your like, lips? Mm. You want to read about your lips, Governor? No, really. From a marketing perspective, it was a brilliant idea. Oh, it was 1988. I'm having a flashback. I'm going all oh, wobbly, 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 wobbly. It was 1988, and I knew that George Bush would endorse my book, My Lips, on every TV station in the world. Read my lips. Read my lips, he said. Read my lips. Read my lips. So this book of yours called My Lips, mm -hmm. did people read it? No, it didn't exist. It wasn't a book. It was more of a punchline, really. Lovely jubbly. Mm. Tell you what I can't stand, Gov. Mm. That Jeremy Beadle, mm. I think he's marvellous. Mm. Oh, yeah. I hate him. Dear. Hate his guts. Mm. Welcome to You're the Star, the show where you, the camcorder owner, send in videos of your friends and family seriously injuring themselves for our amusement, and we pay you 50 quid. So sit back as we watch yet another clip of ill luck striking other people. All be made on the cheap. Yes, on the cheap. <laughs> We're a singing telegram, and don't you fret, cause inside this basket is your missing pet. There's only one small problem with your dear little cat. He went under a steamroller and he's slightly flat. Can I have a quiet word with you? It's about your husband. How long will they be in for? Well, at the moment it's hard to say, but I've seen a lot of cases like this, so I guess no longer than the rest of his life. What? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I've probably alarmed you unnecessarily. The rest of his life might only amount to the rest of the week. I'm sure you'll want to come and visit him as often as you can. Will that be okay? No. He's mine now. You had your chance all those years. You were married to him. This job's the only way I get to meet new, interesting, bandaged people. Find your own hospital!
the nurse go at once to Ward F, where Mr. Lobley is coming up with another invention. Quickly, nurse, it's Mong Bing. Nurse, my gin is made run out of ice cubes. 4 a.m. wake up for you, Mr. Lobley. You know what I'm going to do when I get out of here, nurse? I'm going to publish it. Not books and magazines, though. That's all old hat now. I'm going to start a new sort of publishing. People need food for the mind, but food for the body, too. So what they want is edible literature. Open wide, Mr. Lobley. Hmm. Simple. I'll hire seaside rock manufacturers, my printer. And instead of printing paperbacks, you make sticks of rock. Each one with a bit from a famous book written right the way through it. We'll start by issuing Lady Chatterley's lover in peppermint. Just imagine the reviews. A great writer, now a great taste. D.H. Lawrence, a damn good suck. Once it catches on, I'll start up an obesity book club. So you can increase your intellectual weight and your body weight simultaneously. Oh, for a simple monthly payment. Wouldn't work. The libraries would fill up with fat people. For slimmers, we'd issue a special local edition with saccharin. Think about it. Diet books that actually help your dad. You just don't pass muster. Ah, splendid. You're still here. These gentlemen are the top brass from the BBC. Head of Systems Analysis and Head of Bubble Blowing. Gentlemen, wife, I brought you here today to witness an extraordinary development which may well transform the face of broadcasting as we know it. We've been playing a compilation of very dull programs into the patient's brain. And for some reason they've come out transformed. Brilliant. Yes. And he's not only transmuting the programs, he's transmitting them too. Brilliant. Yes. And he's getting even stronger. Just imagine the possibilities. In line with current market thinking, we now have a choice. The traditional BBC with a staff of 25,000, 300 premises worldwide, 809 transmitters, 4,580 lecture easels, and an annual budget of 200 billion pounds. Or the new look Slimline BBC. One man in a comic coma. Uh, plus, of course, uh, a few hundred senior executives to attend lunches, uh, collect awards, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, nurse, nurse, will you cue the uh, tedious endangered species documentary and uh, show him a photograph of Jonathan Porritt? Right, gentlemen. Let's see what he makes of that. Now, through the arch window. Planet Earth. Its citizens are deeply concerned about ozone levels, about pollution, about global warming. We care about the destruction of the rainforest. We wish to protect the otter, the panda, and the dolphin. But what about smallpox. Man has all but eradicated smallpox, cruelly hunting this small and vulnerable virus to near extinction. Today, we've reached the point where there is no smallpox left in the wild. Only a single bottle in an American university laboratory. Many have tried to release smallpox from its imprisonment, but have failed. Smallpox may not be warm, fluffy, or cuddly to you, but every single germ is warm, fluffy, and cuddly to its mummy. Smallpox has feelings too. It wants to get on with its own life. It's a highly contagious viral disease, giving humans high fever, so prostration, and a pinkish rash with a 30% mortality rate. Okay. Now that you've explained it, I must agree. We must stop this wanton destruction of smallpox. We must live in harmony with all creatures in a very real sense. So there you have it. Make room in your bowel for smallpox. <laughs> Teething problems, obviously. But if we could just open up his brain a teensy-weensy bit and have a little rummage around... I take it we have your permission. 
After all, it is in the national interest. Well, I'm in two minds. Ah, you as well. Well, in that case, prepare him for the operating theatre. Oh, bloody, it's a lark, this, isn't it, Gov? Mm. Getting to be a right old polemical assault on the audience's social conscience if you catch my drift, Governor. Mm, mm. Yes, yeah, very shavian. Oh, I like him, that George Bernard shave, Gov. Of course, mm. he had a beard. He ought to have been called George Bernard Don't Shave by rights, isn't he? Mm, don't shave. Look, just drive. Anyway, what a week it's been for you, hey, Gov? Mm, yes, it seems my brain is completely saturated with television programmes. I've become a powerful BBC transmitter. Oh, uh, old blue eyes belching like a good one. And uh, the entire BBC will be broadcast from my head. Power. Power. I think it's the steroids in the meat, the cell. Power control. Lash. Yeah, those steroids they put in those hamburgers. Lash out. My alter ego must lash. Meat. Lash. Meat. Lash. Meat. Lash. Meat. Lash. Meat. Lash. Belgian consulate. Oh, hello. Is that the Belgian consulate? Yes, it is. Oh, how do you do? Good morning. Yeah. Evening. Yeah. Afternoon. Um, on behalf of the British people, um, I'd just like to say that we're deeply and profoundly sorry. What happened? Sorry? Um, I don't follow. Well, that's all, for, for having to live in Belgium. It must be awful. Really? Why so? Well, I mean, when the light bulb blows, you talk about it for months. Really? I understand you put on records of speeches of your dead prime ministers and dance to them. What? I don't think I've come across a more boring country in my entire life. Hmm, I don't know. They just eat whelks. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from London, England. And you're calling all the way to tell me that? Yes, but I'm mental. You're mental? Yes, <laughs> it's, a big, it's, a, it's a big nuisance. Hmm. I just can't stand the Belgians. Well... You know... Uh, uh, no, 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 please don't try to justify it, otherwise I'd break into tears. That would be interesting. You see what I mean? Belgians find that interesting. It's pathetic. You're not a nation, you're a, 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 a pot of grey paint... I have to go. Goodbye. Oh, oh dear. Oh, no. Well, my phone isn't working. Something See? Wrong. I bet you'll talk about that for a couple of years. The evening your phone didn't work. If that wife of yours gives you any grief, my dear, Give me a sign. <laughs>